This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 19 I rose before daylight, and, leaving my family sleeping, descended, to go to the shore to look after my vessels. I found all the animals moving. The dogs leaped about me, the cocks were crowing, the goats browsing on the dewy grass. The ass alone was sleeping, and as he was the assistant I wanted, I was compelled to rouse him, a preference which did not appear to flatter him. Nevertheless I harnessed him to the sledge and, followed by the dogs, went forward to the coast, where I found my boat and raft safe at anchor. I took up a moderate load and came home to breakfast, but found all still as I left them. I called my family, and they sprung up ashamed of their sloth. My wife declared it must have been the good mattress that had charmed her. I gave my boys a short admonition for their sloth. We then came down to a hasty breakfast and returned to the coast to finish the unloading of the boats, that I might, at high water, take them round to moor at the usual place in the Bay of Safety. I sent my wife up with the last load, while Fritz and I embarked, and, seeing Jack watching us, I consented that he should form one of the crew, for I had determined to make another visit to the wreck before I moored my craft. When we reached the vessel, the day was so far advanced that we only had time to collect hastily anything easy to embark. My sons ran over the ship. Jack came trundling a wheelbarrow, which he said would be excellent for fetching the potatoes in. But Fritz brought me good news. He had found, between decks, a beautiful pinnace, a small vessel of which the prow is square, taken to pieces, with all its fittings, and even two small guns. I saw that all the pieces were numbered and placed in order, nothing was wanting. I felt the importance of this acquisition. But it would take days of labour to put it together, and then how could we launch it? At present I felt I must renounce the undertaking. I returned to my loading. It consisted of all sorts of utensils, a copper boiler, some plates of iron, tobacco graters, two grindstones, a barrel of powder and one of flints. Jack did not forget his wheelbarrow, and we found two more, which we added to our cargo, and then sailed off speedily to avoid the land wind which rises in the evening. As we drew near, we were astonished to see a row of little creatures standing on the shore, apparently regarding us with much curiosity. They were dressed in black, with white waistcoats and thick cravats. Their arms hung down carelessly, but from time to time they raised them as if they wished to bestow on us a fraternal embrace. "'I believe,' said I, laughing, "'this must be the country of pygmies, and they are coming to welcome us.' "'They are the Lilliputians, father,' said Jack. "'I have read of them, but I thought they had been less.' "'As if Gulliver's travels were true,' said Fritz, in a tone of derision. "'Then there are no pygmies?' asked he. No, my dear boy, said I, all these stories are either the invention or the mistakes of ancient navigators, who have taken troops of monkeys for men, or who have wished to repeat something marvellous. But the romance of Gulliver is an allegory intended to convey great truths. And now, said Fritz, I begin to see our pygmies have beaks and wings. You're right, said I. They are penguins, as Ernest explained to us some time since. They are good swimmers, but, unable to fly, are very helpless on land. I steered gently to the shore, that I might not disturb them, but Jack leaped into the water up to his knees, and, dashing among the penguins with a stick, struck right and left, knocking down half a dozen of the poor stupid birds before they were aware. Some of these we brought away alive. The rest, not liking such a reception, took to the water and were soon out of sight. I scolded Jack for his useless rashness, for the flesh of the penguin is by no means a delicacy. We now filled our three wheelbarrows with such things as we could carry, not forgetting the sheets of iron and the graters, and trudged home. Our dogs announced our approach, and all rushed out to greet us. 
a curious and merry examination commenced. They laughed at my graders, but I let them laugh, for I had a project in my head. The penguins I intended for our poultry yard, and for the present I ordered the boys to tie each of them by a leg to one of our geese or ducks, who opposed the bondage very clamorously, but necessity made them submissive. My wife showed me a large store of potatoes and manioc roots, which she and her children had dug up the evening before. We then went to supper, and talked of all we had seen in the vessel, especially of the pinnace, which we had been obliged to leave. My wife did not feel much regret on this account, as she dreaded maritime expeditions, though she agreed she might have felt less uneasiness if we had had a vessel of this description. I gave my sons a charge to rise early next morning, as we had an important business on hand, and curiosity roused them all in very good time. After our usual preparations for the day, I addressed them thus. Gentlemen, I am going to teach you all a new business, that of a baker. Give me the plates of iron and the graters we brought yesterday. My wife was astonished, but I requested her to wait patiently, and she should have bread, not perhaps light buns, but eatable flat cakes. But first she was to make me two small bags of sailcloth. She obeyed me, but at the same time I observed she put the potatoes on the fire a proof she had not much faith in my bread-making. I then spread a cloth over the ground, and, giving each of the boys a grater, we began to grate the carefully washed manioc roots, resting the end on the cloth. In a short time we had a heap of what appeared to be moist white sawdust, certainly not tempting to the appetite, but the little workmen were amused with their labour and jested no little about the cakes made of scraped radishes. "'Laugh now, boys,' said I. "'We shall see after a while. But you, Ernest, ought to know that manioc is one of the most precious of elementary roots, forming the principal sustenance of many nations of America, and often preferred by Europeans who inhabit those countries to wheaten bread.' When all the roots were grated, I filled the two bags closely with the pollard, and my wife sewed the ends up firmly. It was now necessary to apply strong pressure to extract the juice from the root, as this juice is a deadly poison. I selected an oak beam, one end of which we fixed between the roots of our tree. Beneath this I placed our bags on a row of little blocks of wood. I then took a large bough, which I had cut from a tree, and prepared for the purpose, and laid it across them. We all united then in drawing down the opposite end of the plank over the bow, till we got it to a certain point, when we suspended to it the heaviest substances we possessed, hammers, bars of iron, and masses of lead. This acting upon the manioc, the sap burst through the cloth, and flowed on the ground copiously. When I thought the pressure was complete, we relieved the bags from the lever, and opening one, drew out a handful of the pollard still rather moist, resembling coarse maize flour. "'It only wants a little heat to complete our success,' said I, in great delight. I ordered a fire to be lighted, and, fixing one of our iron plates, which was round in form, and rather concave, on two stones placed on each side of the fire, I covered it with a flour which we took from the bag with a small wooden shovel. It soon formed a solid cake, which we turned, that it might be equally baked. It smelled so good that we all wished to commence eating immediately, and I had some difficulty in convincing them that this was only a trial, and that our baking was still imperfect. Besides, as I had told them that there were three kinds of manioc, of which one contained more poison than the rest, I thought it prudent to try whether we had perfectly extracted it, by giving a small quantity to our fowls. As soon, therefore, as the cake was cold, I gave some to two chickens, which I kept apart, and also some to Master Nips the monkey, that he might, for the first time, do us a little service. He ate it with so much relish, and such grimaces of enjoyment, that my young party were quite anxious to share his feast, but I ordered them to wait till we could judge of the effect, and, leaving our employment, we went to our dinner of potatoes 
to which my wife had added one of the penguins, which was truly rather tough and fishy. But as Jack would not allow this, and declared it was a dish fit for a king, we allowed him to regale on it as much as he liked. During dinner I talked to them of the various preparations made from the manioc. I told my wife we could obtain an excellent starch from the expressed juice, but this did not interest her much, as at present she usually wore the dress of a sailor, for convenience, and had neither caps nor collars to starch. The cake made from the root is called by the natives of the Antilles cassava, and in no savage nation do we find any word signifying bread, an article of food unknown to them. We spoke of poisons, and I explained to my sons the different nature and effects of them. Especially I warned them against the mancanile, which ought to grow in this part of the world. I described the fruit to them as resembling a tempting yellow apple, with red spots, which is one of the most deadly poisons. It is said that even to sleep under the tree is dangerous. I forbade them to taste any unknown fruit, and they promised to obey me. On leaving the table we went to visit the victims of our experiment. Jack whistled for Nips, who came in three bounds from the summit of a high tree, where he had doubtless been plundering some nest and his vivacity, and the peaceful cackling of the fowls, assured us our preparation was harmless. "'Now, gentlemen,' said I, laughing, "'to the bakehouse, and let us see what we can do.' I wished them each to try to make the cakes. They immediately kindled the fire, and heated the iron plate. In the meantime I broke up a grated cassava, and mixed it with a little milk, and giving each of them a coconut basin filled with the paste, I showed them how to pour it with a spoon upon the plate, and spread it about. When the paste began to puff up, I judged it was baked on one side, and turned it like a pancake with a fork. And after a little time we had a quantity of nice yellow biscuits, which, with a jug of milk, made us a delicious collation, and determined us without delay to set about cultivating the manioc. The rest of the day was employed in bringing up the remainder of our cargo, by means of the sledge and the useful wheelbarrows. End of chapter.